All right, it is time for the Burning Platform, which is brought to you every single Thursday. we got lots of things to get into, plenty to talk about this morning, and loads and loads of issues that may or may not affect you. A lot of people are thinking about their pocketbooks at the moment, their wallets. A lot of people thinking about their bank balance, because everything is getting more expensive. And we're expecting a massive, massive, massive petrol price, uh, price hike in the next couple of uh, weeks. Next, uh, next week. Is next week the first Wednesday? It could even be up to, what, three, four rand a liter extra, which is going to hit every one of us hard. Because if you think it doesn't, uh, you just have to watch the food prices and everything else go up in a, com in a commensurate fashion. The notice I saw actually said something like one rand 97 for hmm. unleaded hmm. Um, and just over two rand for diesel. And paraffin, like illuminating paraffin, you, you know... <sighs> Most of us kind of talk about petrol and worry about like getting food and, but there are still lots of people in this country who use paraffin for heat and right. um, for cooking. Right. And that is also going, every time the petrol price goes up, that also goes up. So they, they get a double whammy. It's always, you know, you already are on the lower end of the economy mm -hmm. and you get hit twice. <clears throat> You know, all your food prices and all your transportation costs. And then also Absolutely. in order to cook, to cook and heat yourself. Correct. And these are the realities that so many people are dealing with. Um, and, you know, if, if, you're, if you're putting up with those, don't feel like you're alone. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not just uh, the, the, the poor and the middle class, because in South Africa, when all of this is said and done, it also doesn't make it very easy for people who are running businesses or people who are um, trying to to manage, uh, you know, a, 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 an entrepreneurship, a, a small business. These are the things that are hard. You have suddenly massive logistic price increases if you're delivering goods or you're providing a service or you have staff going between here and there. All of these costs go up, and ultimately they're borne by every one of us. Um, we we unfortunately can't pass this on to anyone else. People are complaining that it's government. I mean. Really, these, this has got to do with international oil prices. It's got to do with our currency and how it performs against other currencies. And, of course, there's a large part of the petrol price that is the government. But some of that we can do nothing about. That, that, that is where we get the money for the road accident fund, where we get money for repairing roads, where we get money for basic infrastructure. I mean, without it, we'd be in even more trouble. So uh, you can argue that, but uh, maybe that's for another day. Let us welcome someone who we often have on the show, and we're always thrilled to have him on, Mighty Jamie, who's always got an interesting take on so many things that are going on in South Africa. Jamie, it's nice to see you. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I hope the audio is great. Audio is perfect. And I mean, I love that background. I know. Jamie, have you moved into a palace? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a good aesthetic background. So <laughs> <laughs> It's beautiful. That's all right, it is. <laughs> you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll no, call it in the grand piano in the background i know we'll, we'll call it it's aspirational for the moment yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> yes it suits you it suits you <laughs> all right thank so, you <laughs> for those people who don't know jamie is an award-winning international debating and public speaking champion and coach and you can find out more about him we'll put up all his handles on social media so you can also follow him and pay attention to what he's doing outside of the show too we got a lot to talk about can we just start guys with something which is always worthy of reflection it's africa day yesterday was africa day and it might be interesting, you know, we check in with uh, JJ Cornish every second week here on the show, and he gives us a rundown of what's happening, not only in sub-Saharan Africa, but further north and further west. Um, and it's always interesting to hear about countries like Senegal, countries like the Gambia. There's quite a lot going on on the continent with respect to, um, you know, Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram and all of that stuff. But there's also a massive change in the French presence in Africa. And I can't help noticing that yesterday the EFF were protesting outside the French embassy. Now, whether you guys think this is relevant or not, I think it's worthy of a mention. Um, he says he wants, Julius, to have French removed as an official language in Africa. I mean, notwithstanding the fact that so many Congolese people who live in Africa, their first language is French, um, notwithstanding the fact that French and English are the two languages that kind of divide Africa, he may have a very valid point, but he's all, almost trying to wash away the past, which is just not practical. For many people, French is the language of commerce or industry 
or of education or of anything else in parts of Africa. There's Francophone and Anglophone Africa. But someone made the point with this that the EFF must be running really low on material. They must have so little, talking about fuel, in the tank that Julius has to talk about French being an official language. By in, in South Africa, by the way, it's obviously not an official language. It's a very rare language, which is spoken by only a few people. And most of those people are people who have come to this country because they've fled other African countries. So it is extraordinary. Even if you don't care about Francophone and Anglophone Africa, it's extraordinary how much publicity Julius gets for inane and irrelevant remarks. What is with the media giving him this attention? And here we are doing it, so you can blame me. His clickbait. His clickbait. That's it? His absolute clickbait. So when, when he holds a press conference to kind of hold court downstairs there at, Nelson, at William Mandela House, everybody shows up because he's clickbait, because he, he, he is entertaining. He is entertaining to listen to. And he does have a lot of followers. So it, it, it really, that's why he gets so much attention. But you know, for me and why I wanted to put this on the agenda for today is the Pan-African um, Conference, which happened in 1900 mm -hmm. in, in London, W.E.D.B. Du Bois. And, you know, there were lots of, as they called it at the time, Negroes who descended on London to hold this conference. We, um, one of the founding fathers of the ANC was there. They were Trinidadian, you know, from the islands and, yeah. and people of African descent from all over the world. In 1900, they set a goal, not just for Africa, but for all black people and people of African descent around the world and defined the problem and what they called the problem of the 20th century, remember this was 1900, would be that of emancipating people from colonial rule, from slavery, you know, Jim Crow and all of that kind of stuff was really at the, at the end of it, right? Yes. And I would say, I think we can all agree, that in 1990, when South Africa was declared free from apartheid, that they had achieved their goal. And it took them 90 years out of, you know, to do that. And today, what we don't have in Africa is we do not have vision led by Africans and African leaders and African citizens for what Africa's defining problem that we need to address over the next 100 years to move Africa to the next level is. We don't have it. We don't need, and listen, in South Africa, we don't even have a leadership that has a defining goal of what the problem we should be tackling today in South Africa to move to the next event. You know, in fact, they've gone backwards, I think. Just you, when you hear all of the talk that they have of, of the past of colonialism, of apartheid, not that that does not inform some of the problems that we still have today, but that problem was defined in the 1900 and work was done to solve it on a global scale. And we don't do that now. And that's why we see such poverty, such strife. We see Africans by the boatload trying to cross over into Europe because we don't have vision. We don't have a vision and leadership that's willing to work at it to get us to the next level. So I kind of think every year when it's Africa Day, it's always nice to, to think about it and, and reflect on how far we've come but I think we need to start thinking and redefining where we are going. Yeah, I, I don't know anyone who's setting a ninety-year goal, but but I think that's such a valuable, such a valuable assessment, Pumi. I mean, when you think about the fact that it did take ninety-four years for that that goal to be that very noble goal to be achieved, you know, what are the noble goals of the ANC building a hundred-meter flagpole, which it obviously, you know, I mean, everybody's talking about this because it's such a a, a, a kind of um, an electric issue. It's such an obvious one. And, and thank God, I have to say, like the people of South Africa, whether it was just noise on social media or anywhere else, uh, getting this thing turned around with the president eventually canceling plans to do that, that does show you the power of people, even if it's in a, a very subtle sense, even if it's in a, an outrage, a form of kind of noise on, 
on social media. Well done to the people of this country for saying, no, no, you're not going to spend $22 million on that bullshit. Give us some proper worthy goals. And if we're going to have legacy, if we're going to have some monument to reflect on you know, this period of our history, let it be something worthy. Uh, Tabo Mbeki put up Freedom Park. Nobody complained about that. It was a necessary addition to the Pretoria skyline. And I know this flag would have gone there. I'm a big fan of, of adding value of every generation, building monuments, keeping the history of the country alive, memorializing the people of that time. But I agree with you. Like, what are, what are they going to say about us in 100 years? And it really does not have to be the preserve of the ANC. It is not the preserve of the ANC. Setting an agenda, and and this for me, and why Africa Day tends to be the the right time on which to to reflect on these things and push our leaders towards it, right? Is is because it's about about now that it's called the African Union, it used to be the OAU, which is what Mm -hmm. Africa Day coincides with when they first um, were propagated, the OAU. We have the African Parliament, but really and truly, what is Africa's agenda? Other than what is being said in boardrooms of NGOs and head offices of grant makers all over the world, what is our agenda as Africa, as Africans? And what does Africa look like 100 years from today? I'm glad you tabled that. What do you have to say to that, Jamie? Because I saw you nodding to some of what Pumi was saying. Um, so I think the first place that I'm going to start is just to discuss the um, relevance of the EFF um, going to the French embassy and whether or not, you know, it's an empty canister of gas or whether there's there's something that matters to it. And I think the first thing is just to remember that we often get stuck in a bubble in South Africa and we don't appreciate how much, um, you know, the dynamics in the rest of Africa uh, play out. And you often then see when you go to um, international bodies, and if you recall last year, uh, was it last year when they, they were trying to vote for the, the Pan-African Parliament? Yes, you could it was. see that there was a big division between the Francophone-speaking countries mm-hmm. and the Anglophone-speaking <clears throat> countries because there's a bit of tension there. And some of mm-hmm. that tension is inherited from the contestation between the French and the British. But some of those divisions were... Were, were, were cultivated uh, mm-hmm. in a neo-colonial uh, paradigm. So if the Francophone world in Africa is very important. And it's, it's important to also understand what Pan-Africans think about France. So three examples, I think, will, will illustrate the point. Number one, uh, France was very involved in pushing the no-fly zone in Libya. Uh, in 2011, which was critical to the fall of Gaddafi. Now, whatever you think about Gaddafi, you have to also think about the post-war democratic situation. Post-2011, Libya became a failed state. Previously to that, it was um, dictatorship, maybe a benevolent dictatorship, maybe a not-so-benevolent dictatorship, but it was stable in some respect. And after 2011, Basically, the country was uh, was split into many fractions, and they were they were um, warring militias, people trying to contest for oil and all of that. And the long and short of it is that that is when you begin to have an immigration crisis um, in in the EU because a lot of people were going through Libya uh, and then going into Greece, into Turkey, into th- through the Mediterranean Sea, and that exacerbated um, the immigration challenges that were being faced uh, in Europe and basically uh, contributed to to what we now know as Brexit and the rise of Boris Johnson. So that was a critical moment in history. And many people in Africa view it as something that also contributed to a lack of stability in that particular region. Because if you know, in the Sahel region, there has been terrorist activity that has been affecting Mm -hmm. three countries predominantly, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mali. And that has led to the burning of schools, the killing Mm -hmm. of children, the the, uh, general instability in the region, all of which can be traced back to what France um, uh, advocated for. Because they, they... got their guy, Gaddafi, that they wanted to get, but they were not committed to a post-war transition. And so after Gaddafi was dead, you know, they were basically hands off. So that is a more recent example, if you will. But another example is uh, what has been going on in Cameroon. Uh, Cameroon has been under the leadership of Paul Bia for the last 42 years, since 1982, actually. And he is a dictator. He's somebody who runs a faux democracy, their elections, but he rigs them. And he um, basically tries to 
uh, oppress the people of his country and extract resources. Many of the years um, that he has been president, he hasn't even been living in, in, in Cameroon. And he has actually been waging a war against the English speaking people who have really been frustrated about um, their exclusion from the economy, even though critical resources such as rubber are actually extracted from their side of the country. And I, I'm just going to pause you for a, Jamie, just for yeah. a moment, Jamie. We must not forget when we talk about Paul Bia, because it's my favorite thing to talk about. His wife, Chantal Beer, and her amazing, <laughs> amazing hair. I, I'm going to put this picture up on the screen. I know that we're being serious here. But yeah, I, yeah. No, that's a wild uh, that, hair, that hair that, is also serious. Yes, Tina so, Turner inspired. That's all absolutely. I can say about it. But, but Jamie, so, I mean, just, if we can, because I'm, I, I, I don't want us to yeah. leave any of this behind. I think everything that you're saying now is massively relevant. I'm just concerned about the chain of causality. You know, Gaddafi, the, the, it's not just the French who can take the blame there. We know of course. that... The, that, that, that Barack Obama's administration and chiefly Hillary Clinton, who was then the Secretary of State, did a lot to destabilize that region. And we, of we, course. we, we may blame Macron and his, pre, and his predecessors in France uh, going back some 20 years. In fact, you could go back 100 years if you wanted to. Um, but there are lots of other people who are also to blame here that, that gl glossing over them and making the French the bad guys is, is a little simplistic. I'm sure you'll agree. Look, well, I don't you think know, it's just about, sorry, Jamie. I, I, Gareth, I don't think it's just about the French being simplistic. I think it, sorry, being simplistic about the French and their role in Libya. It is also mm. about the military presence of France in Absolutely. Africa. You know, if Absolutely. you think about Mali, Cameroon, yes. there, there are so many different places where there are French legions. But because, in those but countries. very often, very often by invitation of the leaders of that country. This is what I wanted to say, and this is the thing, Jamie, you know, is I don't think that anybody downplays how um, the French or, or many other military powers uh, play a role in Africa and the instability in Africa. And sure, Julius definitely has a bone to pick around those things, and we cannot be insular as South Africa in terms of what else is happening across the continent. But the reality, and this is the failure of African leaders, is that whoever pays the piper calls the tune. So for as long as people, for as long as African leaders are content to be beholden to all of these various, and it's and, and again, it's not just governments. I want to make the point that NGOs and what is termed civil society organizations mm -hmm. call a, a, an inordinate amount of power in terms of policies that are made in Africa, in terms of the things that we, we kind of are going to look at, are we going to complain about, because they have the money and they can buy the influence. Yeah, big problem. I want you to carry on, though, with your examples, Jamie, because I was interested in the third one. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, th the point I was making is that countries such as Cameroon, what you, what you have there is regimes that have been propped up uh, by the French. Uh, specifically for the for the interest of either having French companies doing exploration or uh, providing um, mobile services, com companies such as Total extracting resources such as rubber, um, you know, coca and and, and a variety of of um, goods that then get refined in France. So it's not just Cameroon. If you look at countries like Gabon, you know, where the Bongo dynasty basically has been running that country like it's it's a like it's a like it's a kingdom. You know, you mm -hmm. had Omar, then you had the Sun come after. And all of that has been because the French regime has propped up these leaders, has supported them in ways that benefit France. So as, as much as um, there's, there's a good discussion to have about what African leaders allow and disallow, there's a different discussion when you have a former colonial power, which is one of the, you know, the, the, the P5, um, basically propping up regimes for protracted periods of time. Because you can't really say that those regimes, are, one, leading in the interest of the people, and two, that they enjoy um, the mandate from the people. They enjoy yep. a mandate from France. And as long as they continue to, um, you know, provide France what is in alignment with its foreign policy, they will stay in power resources. And France also controls a lot of uh, the currency dynamics um, why, why, in why the former Francophone world. You know, I, I, do hear, I do hear that point, and I think it's a very well-made point. And, and France has got bloodied hands, just like Belgium, just like England, just like all of the other colonial powers do but we're looking back now some 60 to 100 years even in the most generous applications here and these these regimes 
are, are very much these kleptocracies, which are which are often propped up, as you rightly say, by these these former colonial powers. If you're a, a Frenchman, though, um, it is in your interests for French ideas and French businesses and French Absolutely. interests all over the world to be sought. And I don't know why we apply a different standard to France and we expect them to be altruistic and going around the world doing good when we don't apply the same thing to our own neighbors in this country when it comes to people who come to South Africa to seek out better, you know, greener pastures, healthier opportunities. You know, we treat Congolese people in this country either like car guards or bodyguards or worse. And it seems to me like we, we have this idea that the, the Europeans must behave in a better way when we ourselves don't in Africa. And we expect people to, have, to apply a different standard to themselves and somehow hold themselves to, to a, a standard that we would never hold ourselves to. I think South Africa has exploited our relationship with so many other, other African countries in our own interests uh, for 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 as nasty and nefarious a purpose sometimes, whether it was under the apartheid regime or since 1994, if you consider how we've imposed ourselves on other African countries, sometimes the, a part of the, the chagrin, remember when um, Kwasasana Dlamini Zuma was passed over for AU chair, um, and we were all upset because we said, oh, we're, we're South Africa, we should be important, we should... We should have our way, remember? And it was, again, largely Francophone Africa who stood against us. Do we not have some kind of superiority complex when it comes to the continent? Uh, I know Zimbabwe, Zambia, Angola, Botswana even, sometimes have not very nice things to say about the way South Africa behaves. Well, well you know, I think actually South Africa doesn't do enough in, in, in the region. We, o we almost hands off because, you know, uh, one of the criticisms about the AU as a block is that it's it's been a dictator's club. And when they rebranded it and tried to relaunch it, they were trying to move away from the dictator's club framework to something that would uh, more uh, instill liberal values across the continent, uh, uh, values of freedom, uh, values of uh, human rights, et cetera, et cetera. But um, what, I, what I will agree with you on is that we don't have great relationships with the rest of Africa at an interperson level. But there are some economic benefits that do accrue. You know, you've got companies like MTN and Vodacom uh, operating on the continent. You've got South African retail companies, which have uh, gotten a lot of uh, benefits from the failure of neighboring countries because we export resources, um, I mean, retail goods to those countries in, in mass. A lot of the trucks going into Zimbabwe, a lot of the buses going into Zimbabwe and the rest of Africa are carrying goods that basically came from Checkers and Jet and uh, Mr. Price and Pick and Pay and all of that. Right. So we're, we're pro providing even, a lot of resources even, even, and even equipment. DSTV, you know, DSTV is yes. looking for audiences all over this continent and, um, and they're getting them sometimes uh, at the expense of local language, culture, uh, and, and very often local production. Um, you know, there, 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 there used to be at least very, very successful and small businesses that were creating this stuff. DSTV comes in and wipes them off and they end up with either Nollywood or South African content, even if they're in Mozambique. Sure, sure. But, but you know, um, I, I think um, I'm going to be cautious about the, the media framework because a lot of these African regimes are still dictatorship. And uh, sometimes there may be a benefit to having a DSTV. The reason why I'm saying this is because, for instance, in Zimbabwe, you have one television channel, the Zimbabwean Broadcasting um, Corporation, and it's based ZTV. It's controlled by ZANU-PF. And you can't get like um, any independent thought on that platform. You can't get any criticism of government. You can't get any real discourse. I mean, if we were having this conversation on ZBC, like at the end of this conversation, we'd all be arrested uh, and right. would probably be in and out is, of jail for the next year. So, I mean, DSTV just provides... The this is precisely the problem with our leaders in general. So when you talk about the Pan-African Parliament, when you talk about the African Union, the fact that they are unable to hold each other accountable is exactly where the problem lies. I mean, they were unable to call Mugabe hmm. to order. They are unable to, so where there is no uh, freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of movement. And we would be, as a continent, all of us, so much better off if, our, if, if the, the, uh, the AU was to actually do what they have set out in their uh, constitution to be about 
a better relation across Africa for trade, for economy, for freedom. Then we, and, and those leaders to hold each other accountable. I know my favorite person being Cyril Ramaphosa, and you talk about South Africa not playing enough of a role, <laughs> Jamie. But, but it's true. South Africa has the economic muscle. And South Africa for a long time also had the, the, moral, the, moral authority, yeah. the moral authority to be able to shape the discussion across the continent, to be able to move the continent to a place, also because we have the money, right? So a, a lot of, and, and again, this is why somebody said in the comments, South Africa is like the car of Africa. It, <laughs> It is also because economically, you know, South Africa has always been in a position, historically been in a position where, again, we are the, the purse. We hold the purse to all of those things. And so we could use that authority to push for more freedom, to push for, in Zimbabwe, for instance, when Zanu PF lost the election, we could have pushed for that. But it didn't suit the government of the day to be vocal about it. And that's the problem. That's the problem with the AU. And, and don't worry. Because they're worry. scared we, of each other. But we, we are bearing the costs of that now. And all Absolutely. Over, all over South Africa, there are Zimbabweans who are trying to eke out an existence. And all over South Africa, there are increasing incidences of xenophobia. And we're not doing anything to improve our relations with our near neighbors. Because uh, the people who are coming here are not coming here because they love South Africa. They're coming here because they have no other option. And uh, it's it's because of the policies of our government and the Zimbabwean government over the last twenty years. There's no way to make an excuse, you know. And this is also where people go, well, history is so complicated, right? And the French, being in Africa, and their influence here is clearly on the balance of things, probably the bad thing. Um, and that's why when Julius goes to the French embassy, I don't think it's about francophone versus anglophone Africa. I don't think it's about colonialism. I mean. There probably isn't anyone alive in South Africa who can remember the last French governor general of the Congo. Or, well, in the Congo was Belgian. But let's say um, Cameroon, for example. But the problem is that these things are just a, a desperate attempt by a local political party to kind of have a go at colonialism, maybe because they've said some quite xenophobic things about the people who come from those French African countries. And now he's trying to get some attention. I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, authentic. I don't it's think a it's little authentic. bit more than that, though. It's a little bit more than that. The, the thing about what the Francophone bloc within the AU, the role that they play, and, and I think it's a, a marginally clever strategy by the EFF to do that and put themselves on the map in that way. And this, this was an insight I got from uh, we were talking about her the other day, Gareth, in, in the office. A, a friend of mine's mother was one of mm. the founding members of the MDC. Right. And mm -hmm. for, for the people who, who do not remember this, kind of in, in 2000 is the year that the MDC was, had quite a strong showing in the general elections at, uh, in Zimbabwe. And for the first time, I think Zanu PF were, were faced with a very strong opposition that people had voted for. Those, are the, the days ground, of, those are the days of what, Morgan Tsangarai? Uh, those are the days of Morgan Tsangarai. And at the time, people on the ground are saying that the MDC essentially, had a, on a very slim margin, won that election and Zanu mm -hmm. stole it from them. In 2008, when they had their next election, which is where the power-sharing government in, in uh, Zimbabwe came to, to be. But from the MDC, one of the things that they know was what worked against them in terms of the international community coming to their aid against ZANU-PF is because they were unknown. So when the UN, the UN is not calling some MDC to say what's going on over there, but they are calling the AU to say, who are these people that are the MDC? What is the status quo on the ground? And what, what Julius Manema is doing with the EFF by putting himself on the map in this manner is the AU is now 
acutely aware of this party and their policies and where they stand on the African agenda. So when the time comes, as we know it is coming in 2024, of a reckoning with the ANC losing ground, they are going to need people to vouch for them on a global stage. And the AU is very likely to be that, you know, that, that kind of ally that's a, for them. That's a very interesting point. I do want us to move on. I, I, by no means do I, do I not feel like giving this the attention it deserves, but we have spent half an hour, and I know Jamie's got some points that he wants to bring in here too. So we spoke about uh, gun control in the first half of the show this morning because there's this horrific Texas shooting. Uh, there was that horrific shooting in Buffalo, New York, just the other day. America seems to have a, a very particular problem with gun violence. And I wondered what you think, Jamie, and what you think, Pumi, we can learn from that here in South Africa and what, what we should be doing to, um, to mitigate in the case of, you know, uh, we're third, by the way, on, on the list of school shooting countries in the world. We only have six, according to the latest statistics. America has some 288 uh, Mexico comes in second. It was an interesting tabulation. And those are the latest statistics. But it's worth reflecting on, even though in South Africa, by no means do we have the same level of trouble. And where it happens in South Africa, it's either gangsters, uh, largely, um, mostly in the Western Cape, but there are isolated incidents here too. What do you think of this, Jamie? And, and what's your point of view on all of this? Well, I think that it's 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 an it's a classic exhibition of the failure of democracy when you allow lobby groups to participate in your politics because the democratic system is one where the lawmakers are representatives of the people and they're supposed to make decisions that are in the interests of the people. But when you have these lobby groups that can now influence the political system with money, uh, with these uh, super PACs, et cetera, et cetera, then you have politicians now paying attention to the special interests. In this particular case, it's the National Rifle Association. I mean, they've had, I think if I, I still remember correctly, 27 school shootings this year alone in America, 144 uh, mass shootings. There are more mass shootings. Uh, there are two or more mass shootings a day in America, actually, at this particular point. And there have been 900 mass shootings since Sandy Hook, which was the most atrocious um, um, shooting that happened um, in a school in 2012. Now, in the UK, in I think, just let me get my notes right on this. There was a shooting that occurred in 1996 uh, in Dunblane at a in primary school. Island. And 16 people were killed and a 45-year-old teacher was killed. Uh, yes. By the end of 1997, the UK parliament had banned private ownership of most handguns. And this they actually built on other bans which had occurred after a different shooting in Hungerford, uh, where a semi-automatic weapon was used. So already there had been a semi-automatic weapon ban, and then they banned um, the rest of the guns. They've only had, I think, um, one, uh, one, no, no, they've had no, 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 sorry. They've had one mass shooting in 2010 in Cumbria right. that I left 12 to... people dead. Since then, I... they haven't had any I mass shootings. Wanna, I just want to talk about the NRA for a second, because the NRA... Mm. Obviously, a lobby group uh, massively in favor of the legalization and, and availability of all kinds of weapons. Um, but they're also a group that has some 5.5 million members in America. And those are ordinary citizens of the United States who really like guns, clearly. Now, they're a lobby group, but at the same time, there is an equally large, if not larger, anti-gun lobby uh, in, in America. There is one in this country, too. We've got Gun Free South Africa who are well-funded and work very, very hard to try and prevent fi private firearm ownership. In a country like South Africa, though, we know we can't rely on the police. We know that if someone breaks into our houses, as I told Pumi sadly happened to a friend of mine just yesterday, uh, we have no recourse anywhere else. We can't trust the machinery of state to come to our aid. And if someone broke into my house, I would rather rely on my own resources, whether it's a sword or a knife or a gun, than rely on calling the police. And, and that's just a reality for South Africans. In America, they obviously have a culture of a, a, a militia, you know, an armed citizenry. This comes from the same way we talk about history in Africa and colonialism and what a, an, an ongoing long tail colonialism has in terms of its effect on the way we think, the way we talk, the way we interact. Similarly in America, and for probably less time than colonialism had on this continent, they have been 
an armed <laughs> citizenry who rise up either against each other in the civil war just 170 odd years ago or in the war against Britain, the first war of independence, some 200 and something years ago. It's a country where this is the tradition. And of course, it's going to have horrific and negative consequences of the worst kind. Uh, but it's not something we're going to breed out of them just by making laws. And trust me, they've tried. In certain states, they have tried this. In certain states, they've made it law that you can't carry, that you cannot own a gun, that you can't drive around with a gun. It hasn't always worked. You know, Garrett, the, the thing for me, and we spoke a little bit earlier about the culture of America and gun ownership and brandishing weapons. Um, there is a lot to be learned for South Africa. And it's about culture. South Africa has become, over the past 20 years, an incredibly violent society. And that's, you know, when we talked about um, shootings in schools and you said we've had sex and I said shootings, you know, because what we do have a problem with in South Africa, especially in the schools, is stabbings. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and this is... This is indicative of the kind of society that we have. And if, knives if are Africa, easier. Maybe, knives and maybe, sharp objects are easier to carry, to to hide, to bring into may, the maybe if, environment. Maybe if we if we had um, more guns, we would have more shootings. We would have more shootings. It's very difficult to get a gun in South Africa. It's difficult to purchase the fi right. a legal firearm, even an yes. illegal firearm. I think it's very difficult to get hold of one. Absolutely. Um, but but we do have a violent society. And that's what we need to worry about. You talk about the failure of the police system, policing. Again, it's something that in South Africa we need to get a handle on and very quickly. As you know this, I say it often on the show, that I do believe that violence should be the reserve of the state. It is the state that should have the right to mete out violence. It's not every single person. You know, we want strong policing. We want visible policing. And we want the police to be there to apprehend criminals or criminal behavior. And we don't have that. And by not having that, it is breeding a culture in our society of violence and contempt because people feel that they have to protect themselves. That's, I, I just, that's what I look, we need to do. I mean, I, I, I fundamentally dispute the fact that the state should have a monopoly on violence. I think that's the only reason that they can extort taxes from us. I think it's the only reason that they can abuse us as they have been in South Africa since the dawn of time, of the dawn of governments in this country. Individuals have some responsibility to protect themselves, even in the most well-run democracies. I mean, Switzerland is, is famously a country of a militia as well. They don't have a standing army, but every adult man in Switzerland is required to have a gun, and every adult man in Switzerland is required to report for military service if, through some bizarre machination in European politics, the country of Switzerland is invaded. And yet they don't have school shootings, and yet they don't have the violence that America does. And I think it's and not... It the culture of the, it's the, and it is the culture of that country that is yes. what we are talking about. And this is why I'm saying that one of the things that we need to get right fundamentally in South Africa is the culture of South Africans. And we have famously, again, we have the highest rates of GBV, gender-based violence in this country. And this is indicative of the fact that South Africans are violent people. And, and worse, that's what we need to get worse right. Than that, Worse than that, we know that the, the victims of gender-based violence very often know the aggressor and, and the attacker personally. They know these yeah. people. They're, these are not strangers walking on the street. Um, and also to your point, Jamie, I just want to throw this in here because I do think it's relevant to the point you made earlier about Britain, that after they banned guns, knife crime skyrocketed in places like London. There are young people running around with knives, threatening pretty much everybody and if not stabbing them. So it has become a next level Kind of, and obviously, a knife can do a lot less damage than a gun. We get that. And a, and a handgun can do a lot less damage than a, an automatic rifle. We get that, too. I don't know why anyone who lives in a town in America would ever pick up a gun of any kind and go and shoot school children. There is something so revolting about that that it's just – it beggars belief. And I wonder how much of what the theory that we're discussing actually matters – in a world where people are crazy enough to do something like to go into Buffalo, New York, and just kill people because they're black, 
You know, you go into a school and kill innocent school children. You have to have some real problems going on in your head. And as Pumi points out, what is it about the culture of America that makes it such a, a, a swamp for this kind of thing? Do you have any idea? Yeah. So I, I think first and foremost, it's 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 important to point out that the control element has has been effective in countries like Australia. I think they had um, uh, a Tasmanian shooting in 1996. And after they banned, um, you know, ass uh, assault weapons and all of those other kind of weapons, they, they haven't had a mass shooting. I think they didn't have one for 10 years after that. Um, so even though there the are other tools that can be used by people with uh, malicious intent, uh, criminals, etc., it, it does. It, there is something that happens when you have control, but Americans are not having any of those conversations in a meaningful way that leads to even modifications on the age of gun purchase, um, more mental health screening for, for gun buyers, etc., simply because the system has been so fragmented by lobby groups. And you ask, what's wrong with the culture in America? The culture in America right now has, has led to democratic failure. If you were to ask me right now, does American democracy work? No, it doesn't. And that's why you have the mental health issues escalating. The mental health problems in America have reached, I think, levels that now, I think almost every American is dealing with some kind of a mental health issue. And that's because their legal, their legislative making system has not stepped in the gap to close some of the social ills that should be dealt with at a lawmaking level. I mean, these guys don't have uh, maternity leave. They, they don't have, um, you know, uh, public health care when other poorer countries can deliver quality public health care um, like, for their like, citizens. Like who are we comparing them with, for example? Canada, Britain, um, two examples that should suffice for the purpose of our discussion. But w when, when you look at America, you look at the failure to protect um, the minimum wage, where that even is is a debate, where you've got the inequality skyrocketing these, in the last fifty years. With, these don't have to do with gun do. crime directly. They do not not not, ne making, not necessarily just gun input. crime. This is a massive causal. Uh, so so let me finish the point. Let me finish know. the point because I'm making a, I'm making a meta point that the mental health issues in a generation of Americans have been exacerbated by the failure of their Congress and their Senate to stop negative externalities, which do affect a society. So I'm not saying this particular crazy person who shot people in the mall, sorry, in the school was affected by all of that, but you, we're talking about culture broadly. And if you have a situation where big pharmaceutical companies block um, the, the reduction of drug prices, okay, private but, healthcare but, companies uh, block uh, access Jamie, to healthcare. No, but, but Jamie, no, let, you, let me make is, the point. The point I'm making is, uh, hear me out so that you can assess the argument in its totality. I'm mm -hmm. saying to you that when you have all of these lobby groups protecting their sector of business, and I'm going to give you, let's use, let's use two examples. Let's just use two. The reason why there was a baby formula shortage in America is partly because of the oligopoly that exists in baby formula manufacturing. You've got three companies that manufacture baby uh, formula. If one of them is eliminated, then you have a shortage immediately for whatever security can, reason. Um, so say, so how I did you get? This? Let me just finish. Let me finish. No, no, I want you to finish, but I, I think yeah. we get we get your we get what you are saying. Stop with the examples so you can get to your point and we can respond. So 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 the point that I'm making is that when you have lobby groups creating social ills because they can prevent positive um, uh, redress by the government. After a while, you have a bad culture, whether it's in the gun sector, whether it's in the stock market, whether it's um, in education. And when you have all of those cultures coming together, you have a society where there are toxic outcomes. And one of those outcomes in specifically the gun side is that crazy people get access to guns, racist people get access to guns, Jane, and they shoot people because the gun the manufacturers and the gun lobby um, control um, the mm. laws around it's, guns. It's just, when we yeah. know at from the other foundation examples, of America, at the foundation of America, the founding fathers of that country, this is how this country came to be always about interests and it was always about interest groups or groupings of people with the but the founding fathers are not moses Hold and, on. and no, they put uh, it in uh, the constitution oh, hey, hey, come down i need to we gave you the opportunity to to make your point so all i'm saying to you 
is that, again, we're talking about the culture. This is one specific sliver. And it's it's easy for you to conflate an issue here by, by making such a leap of causality. There's no leap. Within there's a, no leap. With, that's what well, we hear. I, I, you may by, think like, there's no leap, way, but we hear is a leap. For me, by way of illustration, no, no, no not leap. one of the mass shooters has ever cited minimum wage as being the reason why he took a gun and shot people. I mean, but you're missing the point. The point is, and the democracy fails. The democracy fails because lobby groups prevent negative external externalities from being prevented. Jamie, no, you are. We are listening to what you are saying, and this is what we hear you say. But then, then you're straw manning me. You're straw manning the point because let's let's let me reiterate. Let me reiterate. A negative externality in economics is when you have a negative outcome as a result of market activities. The market activity here is the selling of assault weapons. So when you have a negative externality, what is supposed to happen in a democracy, even one which is a democratic... Hold on. You're assuming that's a negative externality. That it is a negative externality. When people not, get shot in schools no, no, and, and no, no, malls, no, 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 that's no, a Jamie, negative externality. No, that's no. not what you want. Ownership of private firearms is not a negative externality. No, no, no. That's where you're missing it. I didn't say ownership of firearms is a negative externality. I said that the shootings are the negative ah, externality. Sure. And the shootings are a result of... Uh, assault weapons being but, sold to any and everybody without necessary controls. Who wants that? The people who want that us. to happen are the gun manufacturers. Now, you're supposed to come in and mitigate the, 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 the negative externality through legislation. That's the purpose of the lawmakers. But when the gun manufacturers and the gun lobby funds you, you don't take the necessary steps. By the way, there was a gun uh, reform that was passed in 1994. It expired in 2004. And after it expired, the mass shootings shot up. Do you know why it wasn't repassed? Because they lost the vote in Senate and Congress. So why did they lose the vote? Because the I, lobby like took to, action I, and like funded the out, politicians who just, opposed just it. Just because we're, we're going all over the place. I'd like to point out some other secondary reasons. We're in one why. place. Hold on. Where we're seeing all of this because we're looking at the firearms. I think me mental health is a big issue, and I agree with you there, Jamie. But instead of and why is there poor mental hold health on. in America? Because hold healthcare on. is hold expensive. On. Why is healthcare Jamie, expensive? Jamie, because the lobby Jamie, groups. Jamie, we can't. We cannot institutionalize people who are mad anymore. There are lots and lots of people in America who are crazy. I know that this is not a popular way to talk about people who have mental health problems, but in the old days, in, in the days where we were able to diagnose people and keep them out of society because they were dangerous, we did exactly that. Now, they don't do that anymore in America. L.A. and San Francisco are filled with homeless people who are living under bridges and in tents with hypodermic needles spread all over the spaces around them. This is not a healthy country, and I agree with you on that, in that respect. But no longer are we able to treat people with mental health conditions as people with mental health conditions. We're now to normalize them and to have them walking around in society and sometimes buying guns. If we're going to go after guns as being the problem, we need to equally level our aim, if you'll pardon the use of that ugly pun, at the government for having made it possible for mentally ill people to just live in society alongside everyone else. Because every one of these people, almost to a man, is not just full with malicious intent and not just hungry to get their hands on a gun, but also full of problems in their heads. And of, of course, you're can, right. Can I, can, the, I, the, can I respond to that in a minute? Sense, in the indirect sense, you're correct. A lot of these externalities, a lot of these problems that are going on in society are part of the reason. But it's not true. And you can't prove, can I, even if can you I live for 100 that? years, that some minimum wage legislation that is or Are you focusing on the minimum wage? You're missing the point. It's, just, it's an example of what you said. Let, just let, me, let me respond. Let, let me respond quickly. Give me a minute, just an uninterrupted minute. So the three problems that we, you've spoke about in your, in, your, in your discourse just before. One is the gun issue. Two is the mental health issue. And three is the homelessness issue. All of these issues are not redressed because they are powerful uh, corporations that benefit from um, lack lack of strong regulation. Let me give you an example. What are the the, uh, let me finish. Let me finish. So, number one, mental health. If America had affordable and accessible health care, 
a lot of people would not have the mental health issues that they have right now. But because healthcare is inaccessible for a majority of people, I mean, it's in pure maths. If you can, if you've got 300 people, but 200 million people can't access healthcare, those 200 million who don't have access to the healthcare, some of them are going to have mental health care problems. And if you don't support people who came back from the war properly, where they have got PTSD, and then you reintegrate them into society without giving them full support for their mental health issues, guess what's going to happen with some of those people who have had military training? They are going to use those weapons in ways that create the negative externalities. So the issue of the gun control. So firstly, you have got large access of guns in the society because the manufacturers and the lobby are very powerful. They've prevented uh, legislation which used to exist. Then on the homelessness issue, to solve homelessness, you would need affordable housing. But affordable housing is an anathema to uh, big, um, um, what you call it, uh, real estate companies. So the legislation doesn't favor big the real creation. Estate? Yes. Well so Can when, 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 when is the reason we yes. got homelessness, not real estate, yes. yes. like Democrats in California. To have, to have Jared, affordable housing, JD, to have affordable housing, up. the state need to intervene. So you JD, don't have state intervention because of the lobbying. The, your minute is up. Gareth, hold on a second. So all of these points that you are making, JD, we know the statistics in America is that the people who are most affected by all of those points, access to affordable housing, access to affordable health, and easy access to guns, right? So those are the points that you are making. And you're saying these three things, the confluence of these three things is what allows America to have this culture of, of mass shootings. In the mass shootings that America has reported over the past five months, how many of those perpetrators are black Americans? No, no, you see, you, you're, Stop. you're making the mistake. It's not, I didn't say it's a race Stop. thing. And I don't want no, you no, to no. assume. I'm not saying America it's a race thing. Hold on, Jenny. All Americans, well, Americans can't access health care. It's 200 Stop. million people, but 30 million black people. So it's not Stop. about only the black people should be the ones doing the shooting. I, I, but no, they no, are no. doing I it in Chicago. I am not talking about the fact that it is only that. I am saying in the percentage of people that are perpetrating these heinous acts, right? Adversely, because the 30 million Americans are more prone to being affected by all of the things that you say can be directly linked to these mass shootings. Why would is it a disproportionate number of them who are the perpetrators of this crime? So here's my answer. This is why I'm saying that your argument, unfortunately, what no. you are saying may sound like, and you are saying it no. so eloquently and so passionately. However, it is it is untrue because the numbers the numbers no. do not bear witness to what you are saying i have a 30 second answer for this and the 30 second answer is that the mass shootings as we consider them always exclude the kind of black on black shootings as well so if you're saying that there are high numbers of mental health issues ptsd gun access and homelessness in predominantly black communities those mass shootings have been happening they just call black or black crime or gang crime in Chicago, Chicago is the murder capital of America because there are mass shootings there every day, but they don't get counted with these other mass shootings because of the black and black nature of it. So it's just put into the category of, of gang related. But if we extended the definition of mass shooting to black on black gang related quote unquote crimes, what you would also see is that the number shoots exponentially up. But the point that I'm making is if you have lobby groups preventing access to healthcare, lobby groups uh, making access to guns increase, and lobby groups preventing access to affordable housing or legislation that creates affordable I, I, housing, I you have a nexus of, of, I, of, of externalities know, that Jamie, creates I mean, a dystopia. So so this kid and the one who, who, who shot up Buffalo, New York, and all those people who lost their lives there, both of these people, this guy happens to be a trans individual as well, which brings up a whole lot of very uncomfortable well, questions. Well, apparently that's not true. Apparently that was well, a, a, a okay. fake news. I, I'm, it's, it's of no interest to me. It's just something that came up in the comments now. The point being that I think in, in both of those cases, these were people who were probably still living with their parents, the 18-year-old certainly in Buffalo, New York, who had affordable health care, who had... Uh, you know, schooling, they had education for what intents and purposes that that might help to assuage the issues that you're pointing out here. And very many of these people seem to not come from destitution and privation or the lack of government interest in their lives. 
very often they are just disgruntled outsiders. And we know there's an epidemic in America of meaninglessness and purposelessness among young people, which could be at the heart of this. How much do we blame bad parenting? How much do we blame individual mental health issues? And I don't know that a lot of this has to do with government policy. I think you look at it and you realize that you're actually dealing with people. And the big problem with so much of what's going on in the world at the moment, even when you hear Klaus Schwab speaking at the World Economic Forum this week, is that you've got these people who say, we know better, we can make policies that will improve the world. And actually, because you're dealing with individuals, and so many of them are messed up, and always have been, a certain percentage of humanity is always messed up. And obviously, if they can get their hands on a gun, they're that much more dangerous to society. But they could just have a smart mouth and cause as much damage a la Adolf Hitler or God knows who are, how many other people in history. These people are part of society and no utopian government will ever be able to extirpate them from among us. They are living next door to us. As we know in South Africa, a lot of the most evil, wicked perpetrators are people who are known to our wives, our brothers, our aunts, our sisters. And if they had guns, they'd be that much more dangerous. And we can thank God that they don't. But they're still dangerous people. And it's not government policy that makes those people. Some people just are. I just wish and we I had more time. That, I and, wish we and, had more and, time because there are some things that you can do at a state level to prevent um, people with not mental here. health. Le- not when you have not, I'm, I'm talking about in, the, in America. In America. I mean, obviously, here the dynamics are different. Here, I would opinion. like to own a gun, to be honest with you. Here, I would like to own a gun. But, and I but, do. But there are some. We just don't have enough time to to, to explore everything. No, so I just have to say thank you. And no, I sure. maintain that That's it true. is it is a a very bad culture that America has bred in its in its fabric in terms of the entitlement of certain groups of people to take their gun and open fire on an unsuspecting and unarmed part of the populace. Mm. And unfortunately, what we have in South Africa is similarly a different kind of violent society that we are breeding into the fabric of our society, which in time, if if it goes unchecked, in time will get us to a place where that level of entitlement, (laughs) where that level of entitlement of meeting out violence to unsuspecting and unarmed citizens is is not going to be a once in a blue moon occurrence. I'm just going to wrap it up with Congo, Chris, who said Hitler has been mentioned. Godwin's law has been breached. Conversation over. You know, whenever. (laughs) (laughs) My fault. Sorry, but we are at eight o'clock. Jamie, it's always good to have you on. You know what? I I wish you had more time. I know. So do I. And I I think so do, you know, all the people who are listening this morning. I love that we actually got into the meat of both Africa and particularly the the Anglo and, and, and Francophone Africa split some of those things, which you never get to talk about. And this thing of gun violence, which again, in South Africa, thank God, is not as big a problem as America, but we we need to talk about it too. Thank you both so much, Pumi. We will see you next week on The Burning Platform. Jamie, have an excellent week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for being part of the show. Lovely to see you. Thank you, everybody. We will see you tomorrow.